this is Frank Simon here with the rest of the news. We have Corbin Seaver, John Brewer, and we also have a special call-in guest from, what, Washington? Let me introduce him. This is Mr. Raphael Manuel, the fellow and deputy director of legal policy at the Manhattan Institute. He wrote, well, he's published in a lot of prominent newspapers, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, and the New York Post most recently published a pretty controversial article called The Toxic Narrative About Police is Wrong. And we wanted to talk to him about that article to get his perspective on what's happening. Because here in Louisville, we're having a lot of controversy about Louisville Metro Police Department. They're trying to sort of put off the narrative that these people just systemically trying to kill black folk and harass black folk, et cetera. So let's start off by talking about your article, sir. Where was that published? This was published in City Journal, which is a public policy magazine published by the Manhattan Institute. Um, contributing editor there as well. One of these publications I kind of grew up reading, specifically because of all the great work that its writers had done on the issue of policing. And so what I really wanted to do with this piece was kind of contextualize police violence for a lot of people, because in the wake of the Floyd killing, which was indefensible. I think everyone who watched that video agrees that what we saw was an abuse of power. I have not seen any prominent sort of policing world figures to defend the behavior of Officer Chauvin. But what's happened is people have kind of latched on to that video to argue that there is this sort of systemic, deep-seated violence problem within policing as an institution. And what I wanted to do with this article was explain why that's not true. And I think the first main point that's important to make there is that you have to properly contextualize the numbers in light of the overall volume of police activity and in light of the overall number of police officers that operate within the United States. We have more than 680-some-odd thousand uniformed full-time police officers operating in the United States. They make about 10.3 million arrests a year. They have more than 70 million other kinds of public contact, so pulling people over, investigative stops, that kind of thing. And so when you look at, say, the rate of fatal police use of force, what you see is that deadly force is only a factor in 0.003% of all arrests. Could you repeat that number? It's 0.003% of all arrests. Is that about one out of 10,000? Just about. And that's just arrests. Arrests in which police officers are using their service weapons. And, of course, in the vast majority of those cases, the people against whom they are using those weapons are usually armed, dangerous, and actively resisting. So how is it, though, being an average person, you're watching television, you're reading the articles, you're seeing these massive demonstrations, and you just get the impression, oh, my Lord, there's this massive amount of violence that's disproportionately distributed out to black citizens, and that violence is coming from police department, police officers. How is it they've been so successful in sort of pulling off, painting that narrative without the evidence supporting it? Well, I think they've been successful because we live in the technology age, which means that basically every citizen is a journalist, which is to say that the proliferation of smartphones almost guarantees that on a regular basis you are going to be able to capture some instance of police conduct that at least on video will look bad and that can be sort of twisted to support a narrative. And of course, the media plays a role in sort of amplifying these instances as if they represent the center of the distribution of police behavior, but they don't. They represent the tail. I just think it's a combination of them being so good at telling these stories and being able to find pieces of video evidence that, at least on their face, seem to support that narrative, and then blowing that up. And I think that's kind of how we've gotten to the place that we're at now. And so what I try to do with my work is just really beat the data to force people to reckon with the fact that these arguments don't have a very strong leg to stand on. Yes, it's true that if you're using the proportion of the population that black citizens constitute, that you can make the argument that they are disproportionately represented among targets of police use of force. But of course, that's the wrong denominator. We should be looking at 
are things like violent crime rates. And we know that there are vast racial disparities in the violent crime statistics. Black American is about six times more likely than a white American to be the victim of a homicide. A black American is about eight times more likely than a white American to commit a homicide. This is going to inform not only how police deal with those citizens, which isn't exactly what you want because it can lead to false positives, and I think we've seen that, but it's also going to inform how police deploy their resources. And if you are, I think, a reasonable person, you can agree with the idea that police should be deploying their resources to the areas that need the most, which is to say the areas with the most serious violent crime problems. And if those areas are disproportionately black and brown Americans, then, of course, there's going to be a higher likelihood in the data that police are going to have these kind of fraud interactions with people of those demographic backgrounds. But you're saying that your evidence is not showing that there is a bias, bias a racist intent on the police. This is evidence mm -hmm. of systemic racism. Is that what you're, you're arguing with some of your statistics? That's exactly what I'm arguing with. One of the ways I think people make this systemic racism argument is they conflate disparities with racism. A racial disparity is not prima facie evidence that racism is afoot. People will, for example, point to the fact that black men are twice as likely in terms of their odds of being killed by police as white men. So the odds of a black man dying at the hands of police are 1 in 1,000. The odds of a white man, or for men generally, are 1 in 2,000. But the odds of a woman dying in police hands is 1 in 30. 3,000. I don't think that anyone would point to that disparity and say that police are sort of misinterests. And so that's one flaw, I think, in the sort of systemic racism argument. The other flaw is, as we pointed out, it kind of eschews intent as something that they feel necessary to prove. You'll often hear the argument that you can have a racist system without any racists. I kind of reject that definition. I think intent is at the heart of any charge of racism. Most importantly, the systemic racism argument ignores one of the most important racial disparities that we've seen with respect to outputs of the criminal justice system. They always focus on enforcement, but they ignore the benefits of our criminal justice system. And those benefits come in the form of crime declines. If you look at the crime decline that began in 1990, it has taken us to today in American cities across the country, that decline has adhered primarily to the benefit of black and brown Americans. And that disproportionality has to also be incorporated into this debate, how we understand the claim of systemic racism. And I think when you see the system operated pursuant to its stated goals, and that in achieving those goals benefits black Americans to such a disproportionate degree, I find it a strange credulity to argue that the system is systemically racist. Now, not to change the subject too much, but have you ever done any research on the number of fallen police officers, police officers that have been killed in the line of duty? I haven't, for myself, done any sort of systemic work on that. I'm aware of the sort of general data trends. I think about 20-some-odd police officers are killed by felonious assaults in the line of duty every year. Of course, many more die on duty, whether it's car accidents or things of that sort. It is a statistically dangerous occupation. One of the things that I've been writing about, actually, is how the sort of less criminal justice policies, this pursuit of decarceration, criminal justice reform for its own sake, has not only made the streets more dangerous for citizens, they've made the streets more dangerous for police officers. Mm -hmm. When you see police officers who are killed in the line of duty and the suspect is caught, Almost always that suspect either has an active criminal justice status, which is to say they're on parole, probation, or bail, and they often have a pretty extensive criminal history. And as we increase the risk profile of policing, not just with respect to the physical danger, but also now the legal pressures, I fear that a lot fewer people are going to be willing to do that job. I asked for a personal reason. I have a dear friend of mine. He's just retired from the police department. His brother is a police officer. I do a chess education program. I had a police officer who's one of my coaches. The stories they would share with me, my friend, he wasn't in the police officer about a few months. He literally was almost killed because a guy would not show his hands when he kept demanding it. 
and he didn't know if the guy had a gun or not. Fortunately, his partner came behind the suspect and said, put your hands up. And then he threw his hands up. Sir, that man was reaching for a cigarette lighter. And my friend just lost it. He said, man, I almost killed you over a cigarette lighter. And the guy said, well, it's brand new. <laughs> That's a dangerous occupation. So I've done a lot of things, but I've never had to make a decision. A life and death, split-second decision. Do I shoot or do I not shoot? This is a real problem that officers face in the field. And it's one that I think the average citizen doesn't truly understand. My father was an NYPD detective for 20 years, and we had two close family friends, ex-partners of his, who were killed in the line of duty in 2004 by a man who was actually unarmed. He was able to disarm one of my dad's best friends and murder him in cold blood and then win a shootout with his partner. And so even when a gun is not clearly involved, there are real dangers that police officers face, and it's one of these jobs where they understand that the reality is that if they let their guard down, that could be the last time that they do that. And yes. so, especially in high crime areas, I think you do see a lot of officers on edge. I think they are kind of incorporating some of what they see reflected in the data into how they approach the people with whom they deal. And sometimes that can make for really tense interactions. Those interactions don't feel good to be on the other side of. But what people need to understand is that it's not racial animus that's motivated. It's a desire to go back home to their families. Yes. I think that we all have to do more to try and appreciate the fact that these men and women in uniform are putting themselves on the line voluntarily in service to their community, and that's noble pursuit. You said your father was a police officer, is that correct? That's correct. Yes, your father's a police officer, just an average Joe, as you said, putting his life on the line and I don't know. I doubt very seriously if he was making six figures for that, was he? Not even close. <laughs> Not even Not close. Not even close. Very humbly. So our time's about up. Let me just say this real quick. One, thank you for coming on. We appreciate it. We hope we'll be able to schedule again. And I also want to thank Dr. Simon for making this possible. Sir, he's one of our most respected citizens here in the city of Louisville. We just can't do the great work that we're doing right now if it wasn't for Dr. Simon. Dr. Simon, go ahead well, and say something. I I appreciate the comments, and I just wanted to try to bring it home just a little bit. Corbin and our other guest over here, John Brewer, went downtown in Louisville, where we live, and took footage of how the city in general is boarded up. And the churches, at least some of the windows, are boarded up also. And we have a mayor who said, oh, well, he told the police to step down, step back, and to just sort of let mayhem continue, as I would say. I just wonder if you have any thoughts about that. This is something that is unfortunately not unique to Louisville. I think that we are in the midst, in many cities around the country, sort of seeing what the fallout from that kind of posture is going to be. As police are told to back off, as police has it signaled to police that they don't have the support of the political infrastructure of the jurisdictions in which they work, what they're going to do is lay off of the proactive type of enforcement that we know, not only that citizens want, but that we know is associated with lower rates of crime. And as cities like New York, Chicago, and Louisville, and St. Louis experience crime surges, I think we have to really ask ourselves, whether we're taking the right approach here. And the reality is, is that we all want to be able to live in communities where we don't have to board our, our churches and businesses up. We want to be able to live in communities where children aren't touching straight bullets on a semi-regular basis. And the reality is that as of right now, there's no better way to fight against those kinds of problems other than through the police. Mm -hmm. And as flawed as some of what they do might be, we will all be better if we're trying to find a middle ground to try to appreciate the hard work that they do for. Okay. Can I ask you just one other quick question? In general, as far as the nation is concerned, is this attack on cities getting less and less, or is it steady, or is it getting worse and worse? Oh, I think it's likely getting worse. 
And I think it will get worse still. American cities have been in kind of the sites of the sort of more radical branches of the criminal justice reform movement. And I think we've seen that manifest itself a lot recently. For example, in Minneapolis, where George Floyd was killed, the city council voted by a veto-proof majority to disband the police department. You've had cities cut significant funding from their police departments, including in New York City, which just cut a billion dollars of the NYPD's budget. You've had a host of new kind of quote-unquote reforms passed hastily without any real debate or sort of circumspect analysis. That is going to make policing more difficult. It's going to raise the transaction costs of law enforcement. You've got DAs being elected that have no intention of prosecuting criminals to the highest extent of the law. And so I think we're only seeing the very beginning. Well, that's unfortunate. Do you have any thoughts about what the average person like us can do about it? This is a political problem, right? So it always requires political solutions. And so I think the best thing that any citizen can do is work to inform themselves of what the data say, what the issues are, and bring that information with them to their elected officials and, in, and make sure that their voices are heard. Right now, the criminal justice reform movement is sort of being led by a sort of radical group of elites who pretend to speak for regular people, and no one seems to be challenging them. And so I think it's incumbent upon communities to make sure that their voices are heard so that a loud and vocal minority are not dominating the debate. Brother Wanda, thank you so much for that. What is your company's website? What's the Manhattan Institute's website? It's manhattan-institute.org. Manhattan-institute.org. So if we wanted, if you had a book there, so your articles, we can go there and maybe make a donation and get the book or article or Something like Absolutely. that? Okay, great. Could you repeat that one more time for our listeners? Sure. It's www.manhattan-institute.org. Okay. And folks, you can go there, make a donation, buy books and articles. you got to make sure that someone like the Manhattan Institute can stay up so that they can have great men like Brother Raphael doing the kind of work he's doing. It's really important. We're going to end the interview with you, sir. Thank you again. We'll be in touch. We're going to continue our discussion. Thank you very much. That are listening to our program today have no idea of the destruction that's going on downtown. Breaking of the windows of the churches and related buildings. It's just unbelievable because the media will not report this and they don't want anybody to know that there's a problem. And they want it to just fester like a boil or something. Get worse and worse and worse with no treatment for the program. We have to do something because the oh, tourism yes. dollar is so important to the world. Derby coming up uh, in Derby, September. Yes. We do not want the world to come in and to see a good part of downtown Louisville just boarded up. You think it's it trash. You think it's just like a third world nation that just went through a civil war. It's horrible. It's ridiculous down there. I have to do something. I know right now Dr. Simon is part of the movement to distribute a petition asking for oh, Metro yeah. Council to say to the mayor, step down. Now I hear there are other political forces putting forth a similar type of petition. Do you know the website people can go to to sign the petition to get responsible people? Is that on our AFA website? I'm not sure about that. That particular petition, I know that we're working on a petition that Corbin came up with mm -hmm. that actually supports and gives our sympathy with the local law enforcement. I don't know as far as this is what I heard reported, but I heard that the president is now using his authority to surge law enforcement into certain areas. But I don't know if Louisville is one of those areas. It's good if that was happening, but I think what a lot of Louisvillians are saying, it's not necessary. If the mayor would just step up and say, look, Absolutely. enough's enough. We got to clean this up. No one is opposed to peaceful demonstration. No of course not. To that. But that's not what we're talking about that's at all. What we're, we're talking, talking about, about 
burning Louisville, burning Louisville and breaking out all the windows of the churches and all of that. But the media being on the side of the enemy, if you might say, is not willing to publicize right. what is going on. But fortunately, we have Dr. Simon's leadership. What's the name of the Facebook page? American Family Association? That's no, it? Facebook is Frank G. Simon. Go to Frank G. Simon. You can request petitions. We see to it you get right. one. Pass that around. Yeah. Talk about it. Now, Frank other, G. Simon Facebook. The other thing is the left-winger, the anti-American people, are trying to take more money from law-abiding citizens and put it into the anti-Christian, anti-America movement of the public schools. And they are going to raise your taxes 9.5%. And today is the last day to sign the petition. We need something like 30,000 signatures. It's questionable whether we got enough or not. Now, what is that website? Do you remember? For our website, if you look up American Family Association. Of yeah, Kentucky. and it'll be on there, you think? Yeah. That'd be great. And folks, we got to do something here because time and time again, the board keeps asking for increases. I understand inflation, things like that, but at one point, we have to start demanding results. I don't mind giving people more money if I get results. Yeah. They themselves are admitting, well, we're not doing a real good job in yeah, it's like they're black getting worse and, and Latino students, yeah. And especially in the West End, as I understand mm -hmm. it, they're all failing schools, or most of them, a lot, lot of, of them, lot are of them failing, failing schools. schools. And they've been failing for many years. Yeah. And the more money you give them, the worse they seem to get, in so my opinion. Something's got to change. It's sort of like if I keep giving my dentist money to pull a bad tooth and that bad just keep the bad tooth in there. I'll be tag on going to keep all that good money up to bad. I want that tooth out, buddy. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Anything else, John? I don't have proof of this, but I've read a lot about the Chinese involvement and how they're actually trying to undermine our democracy. And it could very well be that it's not just the key players we used to think oh, of as. Wow. Soros. I never thought about that. The communists nationally or internationally are trying to bring America Yeah, that, that connection has always been there. The Black Panther Party, when it was alive and active with Huey P. Newton, Bobby Steele, they went to the People's Republic of China many times, to oh, North goodness. Korea. Eldridge Cleveland, when he fled the United States, he stayed in North Korea. He was in Algiers. He was in People's Republic of China. Ryan Karenga, who was the founder of Kwanzaa, he was very tight with the socialist regime in China. That's nothing new. Been there for a while. So yeah. if you don't think Black Lives Matter is doing it, you ain't thinking. That's right. Okay. Well, we're running out of time. I want to thank Raphael Manuel and John Brewer and Corbin Siever. And God bless you. And tune in again next week for the rest of the news.